what? Food, food is medicine. medicine. Right? <laughs> so if you put the appropriate food in your body, it can get metabolized to great medicines, right? Okay. Welcome to our podcast. The better you are, the better you are. Whether it is physically, mentally, or spiritually, when you know better, you can do better. And when you do better, you'll be better. On this podcast, we share knowledge, expertise, opinions, and experiences. All things that can help you to change the game. By the time we're done, it's hard for you not to be encouraged. So join us. Mitigates all these other problems. The better you are, <laughs> the better, better you are. are. So the better That's you right. are early on in any disease process or before um, um, we identify actual disease. And the earlier we treat it, the better we are. And we certainly know that the better we are before pregnancy, the better we are during pregnancy. And hypertension is often a concern um, and a risk factor for preeclampsia. Dr. Love Davis, can you tell us a little bit about preeclampsia? Yeah, you know, I, I'm so excited that we're having this conversation because everything is connected. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about hypertension and, and like Dr. Dawson was talking about, there are levels to all of this. Um, often we don't just come in and we have what's called preeclampsia. And preeclampsia is basically when we have elevated blood pressures, but then they affect other parts of our bodies. They affect our kidneys, they affect our liver, they affect parts around our brain, they affect so many different things. And then that there are signs of that. But again, it doesn't just start there. So if I can, you know, when we talk about different things, there's something called gestational hypertension, and then we have chronic hypertension. And so when we see women, one of the biggest things is knowing, you know, the preconception, knowing if we have hypertension or not. Because when you come into pregnancy and you already have, if we're already on a blood pressure medication, that means we've got chronic hypertension. If we come into pregnancy and we start having those blood pressure checks in the office and, and then we're more than... 20 weeks in pregnancy, then it's considered gestational hypertension. And then when it gets elevated and we have other things that affect like our kidneys and our liver, we start developing protein in our urine. And that's one of the biggest parts of preeclampsia. So when we have preeclampsia also, there are levels to that. So there's, there's what we call more mild preeclampsia. And then we have preeclampsia that's more severe, what we call severe features of it. And the severe features can be things like a very bad headache. You know, we all have headaches, but when we get a headache that is awful, it's not better with Tylenol, it's not better with rest, then that can be one of those headaches that triggers a woman to say, okay, this is not normal. I know I've been having these blood pressures in the office. I know that they're elevated, but maybe I need to kind of listen to my body. Sometimes we can have vision changes because things around our brain are affected by our blood pressures. And so that's one of those signs that women can have too. And then we also talk about pain in our right upper side. So, so pr pregnant women know pain can happen all the time anywhere, but if it's specifically right here and it's dull and it's achy and it's not when our baby's moving, we need to listen to that because that's where our liver is. And the, the capsule around our liver can be swollen. And that's when we have those signs of that. So if we have any of those things, like I said, the awful headache, the, the vision changes, the pain in our side, then we talk to our doctor about it. That's when we come in, we get those blood pressures checked. And then that's when we do blood testing um, and urine testing, because what we do is we check and see the amount of protein in our urine. Um, at each OB visit, we often get urine testing, but then we specifically look at it to see if protein's in our urine and the amount of protein. Then we get blood testing. We look at our platelet count, or, or you know, one of the things that, that is affected in pregnancy in preeclampsia is that our platelet count actually goes lower. And then we look at our liver function. Our liver function goes higher. And so all of those things are a part of preeclampsia. But again, it doesn't just start there. Um, it's kind of like a, something that gets worse and worse and worse over time, usually. Now, sometimes it hits us and we've got preeclampsia and it's severe, but most of the time there are signs it doesn't just happen overnight. And the only cure for severe disease is delivery. It's delivery. And because it, we don't know exactly what causes it, but it has to do with pregnancy, exactly. has to do with the placenta, mm -hmm. and we have to take that placenta out to cure it. Absolutely. And as Dr. Piles pointed out, they're vital organs that they we are. care about. The head, like you say, with headaches, the brain, mm -hmm. the heart, you can mm -hmm. have heart failure with preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. You can have liver failure. You can have kidney failure. And so it's important to know that. And as 
um, Dr. Dawson had pointed out, we don't know if we have high blood pressure unless right. we come in and check. And you want to see somebody like Dr. Dawson before you become pregnant because a lot of medications are safe in pregnancy, but there are some that we absolutely prefer you not to be on in pregnancy. And, I, and we have other resources. I have heard her talk about that in the ACE and mm -hmm. the ARBs and the um, inhibitors. So that's why it's so important before you get pregnant, mm -hmm. get whatever condition it is under the best control, let your doctor know you're thinking about getting pregnant. Absolutely. There is something we can do to help yeah. prevent preeclampsia yeah, in yeah. some cases. I think it's important to revisit that in this discussion. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So there's something called low dose aspirin or, or what we sometimes call baby aspirin. And so it's not the normal dosage of the things like our Advil or ibuprofen. It's a smaller dosage of it. It's actually only 81 milligrams. And sometimes we take that tablet once or twice a day. Now we think, okay, well, how do I know if I'm someone who should be on this medication and when do we do it? Well, part of that comes into coming into the office and talking to your doctor. Because there's so many different risk factors and there's what's called high risk factors and then there's moderate risk factors. And so when we think about high risk factors, these are the things like an actual history of preeclampsia. Have, do we have type one or type two diabetes? Do we have chronic hypertension? Do we have um, an autoimmune disease like lupus? Like those are things that are more in the high risk factors. And so you only need one of those things before we recommend starting baby aspirin in pregnancy. Now we think about the things that are more moderate risk. And so those are the things that we often don't think about. Being a nullifer first woman, meaning it's your first pregnancy. Um, obesity, right? We've talked about that. And that's just a numbers thing. It's not a judgment thing. It's just literally our, heart, our, our height to weight ratio. And so anytime our body mass index is over 30, that's obesity. And then women, black women, you know? So if you walk in and you are a black woman, and it's your first pregnancy, you've got two moderate risk factors, and that means you should be on baby aspirin. So a lot of times we actually don't understand our risk factors, which is why we have that preconception counseling. That's why we go to our doctors, because it's so easy to be higher risk and not even know it. And the other reason why that's important is because we recommend starting this medication between, between 12 and 16 weeks of pregnancy. So some women don't even know that they're pregnant till about eight weeks, and then it takes time to get into your doctor and then you're 10 weeks and then, you know, you're like, oh, I don't I didn't remember to start this medicine. And then we're 18 weeks. And, and at that point, the, the the ability for it to be helpful is so much less, which right. is why our goal is between the 12 and 16 weeks of pregnancy. There's something about as that placenta mm -hmm. is developing that blocks the cascade of the enzymatic actions. You don't really have to understand it, but it's right. important to do it early on while the placenta is developing, as opposed to later on when we tend to see preeclampsia. Exactly. So I've had women come into my office and say, well, yeah, my doctor told me to take it, but my blood pressure is okay. So I, 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 don't, I don't take it every day. We haven't done a good job of explaining to them why they're taking it. You're not taking it for blood pressure control. Exactly. You're taking it to reduce the risk of preeclampsia later prevention. on. It's prevention. It's prevention. Excellent. Well, Dr. Dungy, uh, Dr. Dungy, <laughs> I apologize. Portis. I like that. I can That's go with all right. That. <laughs> we're all one family here. Nice. Dr. Dungy, I know you're a dentist. Yes. And dentists take blood pressures when patients come in, why is that? Well, one of the things that uh, is, becomes very aware, you become very aware of as a dentist is you'll see patients maybe twice a year, but they rarely go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So you're our first opportunity to evaluate your general health. Uh, we wanna take your blood pressure, we wanna take your heart rate. Why do we wanna do that? We wanna have a baseline, we wanna, we wanna understand who is sitting in our chair. And it's funny when you brought up, you know, the white coat syndrome, people will sit down and say, well, I know my blood pressure is going to be high because I have white coat syndrome. And it's like, <laughs> we haven't even started yet, <laughs> you know, and uh, but there are some very specific reasons why we would do kind of a general evaluation. But blood pressure in particular is it affects it may affect what we do treatment wise and how we do it. Right. So. For example, if your blood pressure is high, and let's say it's just high because you're at our office, but we have a local anesthetic that we use that has epinephrine in it, which will elevate your blood pressure. So if we're taking a tooth out, we may not take it out because your bleeding may increase to a point where we have trouble 
uh, getting you to clot normally. So that'd be one thing. The other thing is we, we don't want to create a stroke because you're in a situation where you have uncontrolled blood pressure. The one issue that we have is that it seems like a lot of people that, that, that uh, come in with a high blood pressure are already on blood pressure medication. So you're like, well, how do I counsel you on that? But I usually will ask them, um, when's the last time you've seen your doctor? You know, and is this being monitored or are you just out there taking medication and, and not monitoring yourself? And to your point, you can know a lot about a patient if they know about themselves. Like, well, I don't know what my blood pressure is. Well, you're on medication. Why won't, you know, well, you're not taking it at home or anything like that. I think the other thing that uh, I would like to point out is that it depends on what kind of device you use. So in the dental office, we used to try and do the cuff, but, you know, having people disrobe and it became difficult. So we use a wrist monitor. So the one thing that we try to tell you is that this is just more of a check. It's not the absolute best procedure, but your, the, the wrist monitor is gonna measure higher than if it's on the, on the arm. So we, we don't get bent out of shape, but we look for trends. And uh, so that's one thing that we wanna know. We wanna know how you're doing before you, we even get started. So that's uh, one of the main reasons why we would start with blood pressure. So it's all important it all, in, in so many aspects of life, and um, that's why this panel is so excellent for us today. I know, Dr. Piles, that hypertension um, is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Suppose you're suspecting some cardiovascular disease in somebody. How do you monitor that with somebody with hypertension? I know that there can be concerns with arrhythmias sometimes related to disease. Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, when I first see a patient who's referred to me uh, because they think they may have cardiovascular disease, we do a physical exam and we do a history. Right. Sit down and talk to the patient. Now, now we don't have a lot of time to see patients, so I integrate the history with the physical together. So as I'm doing my physical exam, I'm talking to my patient. So I ask them about their risk factors. We already talked about the modifiable and the non-modifiable risk factors. And I also talk about, have you ever had your blood pressure checked at home? Mm -hmm. And what has it been? Have you checked it with your doctor? Have you been to a doctor? So that all helps me determine how I should focus on this patient. So I don't really like to start medicines off front because patients don't really like to start medicines up front. They want to try lifestyle modification. But if your blood pressure is 200 over 120, you're going to get some medication. Right. The uh, American College of Cardiology and the ACC recommends that if, you, if your blood pressure is in stage two, you're 160 over 100, you need two blood pressure medications to get it down right off the bat. So I know that information. I try and why is that? Um, I don't I know. I will tell you in obstetrics, mm -hmm. I tell people that's because you're at risk for stroke with that, yes. that sure. high. And so we want to bring that down. Exactly. as promptly as possible mm -hmm. because you're at risk for having bleeding into your head and having a stroke. You're only 20 so millimeters of mercury away from 180. Yeah. Right. Like that. So, yeah, so it, it's very important. So I talk to them mainly about risk factors and how to eat, exercise, and uh, I do a physical exam. I always listen to all of the arteries. I listen to the carotids to mm -hmm. make sure that it's not, we call it brewing. Right. So if you listen to a hose and you put water through a hose and you bend it, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for obstructions. I'm listening for obstructions in the, in the, in the arteries and listening for a brewery in the aorta. And I palpate the, uh, the belly to make sure I don't feel anything that it feels enlarging and abnormal. And I also listen to the groin arteries mm -hmm. called the femoral artery. That's a nice nidus because if you've already developed a brewery there, I'm sure you got heart disease. Yeah. Two thirds of the people who have peripheral vascular disease already have heart disease. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It is a lot. Then if you're diabetic, you already have heart disease by definition. We call it the mm. coronary risk equivalent. So the many years that you have developed diabetes, or had diabetes and didn't know it, you've already developed cardiovascular disease. So it's very, very important to know these things. And talking to your patient, you may not have a lot of time, but you can do both and get a lot of information to help that patient help themselves nowadays and also get on a nice regimen. Mm -hmm. But we always say, Food is medicine. Excellent. Thank you for listening in today. Weren't you inspired, encouraged, and uplifted? We hope so because we're praying the best for you. Join us again next time for more betterment because the better you are, the better you are. <laughs>